Nice to see you all. Very good. So um, this is our last class in this series of Lamrim teachings. Yeah. When we begin to engage in spiritual practice, in Dharma practice, in following the teachings of the Buddha, we take a realistic look at our life. And we realize that to practice effectively, we need a modicum of concentration. Have you noticed? Have you noticed that as you go through these various topics and maybe you're trying to even do a review meditation on, on the stages of death or on the precious human life, what are the eight and the 10, you know, and you try to go through them in your mind and maybe you get, oh yes, precious human life, freedom from being born in the hell realms. And then you're off making your grocery list. And then you forget, which one was I on now? So we do need, in, even in everyday life, we need to have concentration. We need to have mindfulness, to be able to be present in anything that we do. And particularly to be able to probe deeply into reality, into how, what is this life? To be able to probe deeply into that, we need concentration. So we humble ourselves as we begin to practice when we acknowledge that despite our intellectual sophistication or our actual knowledge, our awareness of the mind is so superficial. You know, it's elementary. So learning about the mind and transforming it is the key to enlightenment. Our dilemma is that although we want happiness, yeah, we seek it. But the faulty assumptions by which we live our life don't afford us the pleasure of abiding in a state of constant happiness. So with spiritual practice, through the process of spiritual practice, we gradually replace these faulty assumptions with knowledge that will serve to actually produce what we seek, happiness and freedom from suffering. A mind that is captured by greed or hatred leads us to actions that harm others and ultimately bring a reign of suffering while establishing patterns of behavior occurring endlessly. The same mind is capable of great love and compassion, becoming a wellspring of happiness, peace, and contentment. This very mind that we have right now has the potential to become completely awakened. Meditation directly addresses the mind and is the key to creating a happier life, a more peaceful life, a more contented life, to actually awaken to our full potential. So shall we begin by finding our meditation posture and bringing our awareness into the body. Settling into a comfortable position where we might remain relaxed, still, and vigilant to facilitate the relaxation while lengthening and straightening the spine, I invite you to bring your awareness to the crown of your head. And as you do to do so, begin to gently float down through your body, softening and releasing any tension that you find, beginning with your brow and around your eyes. And coming down to your jaw, around your mouth. Let all your facial muscles be soft. 
as you come down into the back of your neck and across your shoulders. Down the arms to the tips of your fingers. Feeling the hands resting gently in your lap. Then coming back to the base of the skull and floating down the torso. Attend to your upper back around your shoulder blades and your chest. A softening light flowing down to the small of your back. All the way to your sit bones. Your glutes are soft, resting on the seat. Your belly is soft, receiving the full breath. All the way to the ground as you feel the body on the seat. and down your legs to the soles of your feet and the tips of your toes. Fully present in this moment in the state of relaxed and peaceful ease. How wonderful. Allow a sense of stability to arise, of safety. And we notice the breath in the body as the body breathes. Applying no control. Sometimes the breath is long, deep, and sometimes it is shallow. Knowing when you breathe out and when you breathe back in again. Noticing the changes in the body as the breath flows naturally. and fine tuning our awareness by bringing the attention to the tip of the nose, the sensation as the breath flows. We notice the change in temperature.
we notice the pause as the breath turns. And while we attend to the breath, we are also aware of thoughts and sensations. And we allow them to arise and pass. Remaining present on the breath. If we find ourselves losing the object, when we recognize, we simply kindly and gently return to the sensation of the breath as the body breathes.
And as our mind becomes more and more subdued, out of compassion, we think of all those beings whom we would like to liberate from the suffering of cyclic existence. But in order to do so, we need to awaken ourself. But as we think of them, allow them to appear around you. Think of your mother on your left and your father on your right. Friends and family behind you and the troublemakers in your life in front of you. Those who do not share our worldview, those with whom we have differences of opinion, they too long for happiness and freedom from suffering. And then we think of those we have yet to meet and we bring them here too. And we think in order to reach a state of perfect enlightenment, I'm going to engage in these practices for the welfare of each and every one of you. And in order to do so, we call our Lama. Let's see. Just a few clicks. So if you think of your teacher, those who have taught you your spiritual path and their kindness, without whom you wouldn't even have an interest in the Dharma. So think of them as coming here, manifesting as Shakyamuni Buddha, as we call them. Oh, please come, great hero, the teacher of pure creation. Destruction, self arisen, the wisdom of emptiness and that of now, as they come before us, we lead all the sentient beings who surround us in this practice of refuge. I go for refuge until enlightenment to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha by my virtuous actions of giving and so on. May I become a Buddha to benefit all beings. I go for refuge until enlightenment to the mind of enlightenment to seeing emptiness directly and to the Arya beings who have May I become a Buddha to benefit all beings. I go for refuge until enlightenment with confidence in the knowledge that the nature of my own mind is wisdom. Its expression is clarity and its compassion is all pervasive. May I become a Buddha to benefit all beings. 
May all beings abide in equanimity, free of attachment and aversion. May all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all beings find good rebirths and the bliss of liberation. I will help us to have these. Please, Guru Buddha, bless me to be able to do this. I prostrate with body, speech, and mind. I make each and every offering. I confess my mistaken karma and rejoice in every virtuous deed. Please, Buddha, stay until some sorrow ends. Teach Dharma to every sentient being. I dedicate to great enlightenment. And then we make a mandala offering offering everything in the universe. For this ground scented with perfume and covered with flowers adorned by Mount Meru, for world, sun and moon, I imagine as a Buddha land and then offer it. May all beings enjoy this pure land. I send this jeweled mandala to you, my precious guru. And we make this request. Oh, magnificent and precious root guru, please abide on the lotus and moon seat above my head. Guide me with your great kindness and grant me realizations of your holy body, speech, and mind. So we make this request to the Lama to please grant us the blessings. Ali, I wonder if you would turn the lights on. I think it's getting a bit dark. Thank you. So seeing our Lama above the crown of our head, granting us this request to come to the crown of our head and grant us this realizations. Our Lama's body is made of light in the aspect of Shakyamuni Buddha, seated upon a lotus and a moon disk. And at their heart, the light of wisdom and love and compassion begins to pour down as we make this request to receive these blessings. And we experience them coming through our crown and filling us up with all the realizations on this sutra path to enlightenment. May I be inspired by guru devotion uplifted by the preciousness of this human life. May I shed the fetters of attachment and aversion through a knowledge of impermanence, be protected by refuge, guided by a knowledge of actions and their results, aim for liberation through renunciation, 
May I be motivated by bodhicitta, opened by giving, disciplined by ethical behavior, strengthened by patience, enthused by joyous effort, stabilized by concentration, and freed by wisdom. Have a sense of being filled up with all these realizations on the path. And we make the request. Oh, magnificent and precious root guru, please abide on the lotus and moon seat at my heart. Guide me with your great kindness and stay with me always until I attain enlightenment. So now our Lama, pleased with our request, melts into a small sphere of light and begins to descend down. through our crown, coming to rest at the level of our heart. And now we have an opportunity to single-pointedly grow our love and compassion, to grow our wisdom. And just as we have been blessed, all the sentient beings have been blessed and they fly off to the Pure Lands. So feeling this light of love at our heart, let it become energized as you inhale. And as you exhale, allow it to grow. Inhaling, thinking, may I be well and happy. And exhaling, thinking, may I realize my full potential. Conjoining this wish with the breath the light energized and expanding. Love is wishing the beloved to have happiness and all of its causes. Allow universal love to fill you up. Know that you're loved. every cell vibrating with this loving energy. Expanding until it becomes uncontainable and passes through all of our pores in all directions. Knowing that you are loved and it's your nature to love. And as we send the light out, thinking may you be well and happy, may you realize your full potential. Make a wish to see the beloved in every face and allow your love to expand to fill the universe. Mm -hmm. 
May each and every one be well and happy. May each and every one realize their full potential. as you practice like this, you may think of those in your life who are unwell, suffering from a, an illness, depression, anxiety, not having enough, Think to remove all the obstacles as you inhale and let it energize your love. And think to give them exactly what they need as you exhale and see it being received. May you be well and happy. May you realize your full potential. thinking of those who are in hospitals now, their families and their caregivers. May you be well and happy. And may you realize your full potential. those who are suffering from war and oppression. May you be well and happy. And may you realize your full potential. who are suffering from poverty, not having enough. Mothers unable to feed their children. Fathers unable to support their families. May you be well and happy. And may you realize your full potential. all over the world. May people be well and happy.
may they be governed by enlightened politics. May they realize their full potential. Allowing the light to continue to grow out into the universe. In all directions. With no periphery. May everywhere be blanketed by your love. May all beings be well and happy. May all beings realize their full potential. And may I be able to bring this about. how wonderful it would be. Then gradually, like breath on a mirror, allow the light to begin to contract. And as it does so, Conceptual reality also dissolves. Allow it to come back and be the size of the room. And the size of your body. and then a small sphere of warm light right there at the center of your heart. And as you penetrate that with your mind, allow it to become smaller and smaller and even smaller. until now you rest in non-conceptual reality. The knowing of knowing, pure clear awareness. In this pause, recognize your true home. and rest there. In this space-like nature of mind, we recognize mind like the sky. And we might ask ourselves, what could ever rest on any fraction of the sky? Nor can any object rest 
upon your clear light mind. Release yourself into this pristine awareness. Your bonds will all be broken. And without a doubt, you will be free. Let thoughts and feelings, images, be like clouds passing in the sky. And be the sky. And then out of compassion for all those sentient beings you long to free, crystallize back into your bodhisattva body. And when you're ready, come back into the room. So far, we have gone through the cursorily, quickly. We have gone through the sutra path to enlightenment based on Lama Tsongkhapa's three principal aspects of the path. Those three, you remember? <laughs> Definite emergence or renunciation, bodhicitta, and wisdom. So to cultivate this renunciation or definite emergence, we contemplate the four thoughts that turn the mind to enlightenment, turn the mind to practice. We contemplate this precious human life that we have with its eight freedoms and 10 richnesses. We contemplate the fact that we're going to lose it, that death is coming and everything is impermanent. And with those two thoughts, we think, oh, I really, I must practice to have a fortunate human life again. And as we then go forward with the study of karma and the suffering of samsara, we think a fortunate life is not enough. I want to get off the wheel altogether. So those are the, the four basic contemplations, the realizations that we need in order, to, in order to really decide. This is the most important thing. This is, this is saving my life. 
This is renouncing the suffering of samsara. That not renouncing our chocolate or our music. <laughs> it's renouncing suffering. So then we recognize that we're all in the same situation. So we cultivate bodhicitta, this wish to go beyond just liberation from samsara for oneself, but to actually become a Buddha. To overcome even the most subtle obstacles to omniscience and thereby be of the greatest benefit. And we do this, we cultivate bodhicitta. The practices that we use to cultivate bodhicitta are uh, sevenfold cause and effect, where we go through the seven steps on a base of equanimity. Now, first, we need to develop equanimity. One of the reasons why we send this loving kindness to every living being going through the different groups and going to those who are the troublemakers in our life is so that we can really begin to develop this equanimity so that we can really see why do we call some people friends and some people enemies? Why are some people strangers? And are they inherently that? If we really look deeply, if we probe, we see that a friend is simply someone who has helped us or someone we love, someone who has been kind to us or someone we love. And enemies are someone who has harmed us or someone we love. And strangers have neither helped nor harmed. We can see how they morph in and out of these categories, but they aren't inherently like that. So we cultivate on the basis of equanimity, thinking, knowing that this continuity of consciousness has had beginningless lives and will have endless lives, knowing that in each life we had a mother. How could we say that that one who is so difficult and so irritating, how could we say for sure that one has never been my mother? That one has never been kind to me. We can't say that for sure, can we? So on the basis of thinking of the kindness of mothers and thinking that perhaps every living being has been our mother. Then we think of their kindness and how we would long to repay that kindness. And how can we best repay it? We can best repay it by freeing them from the cycle of birth, aging, sickness, and death. We can help them best by liberating them, helping them to liberate themselves. So we get this deep longing, this urge to actually become a Buddha in order to do that. And then there is the practice of equalizing and exchanging oneself for others, which is similar on a basis of equanimity, but one here is contemplating the disadvantages of cherishing oneself and the advantages of cherishing others. And then there is the merging of the two, the 11 point meditation to develop bodhicitta. And that combines the two other methods. So each of those methods gives rise to this universal responsibility, planting the seed of bodhicitta. I must, I must become enlightened in order to liberate every living being without exception. You know, not every living being except you who irritate me. So we think if we're saying that every day, may I liberate every living being. And then very hard to put that one in the category of every living being. So we, again, we cultivate this sense of equanimity in order 
to cultivate this universal responsibility. Right now, without delay of even a second, Lama Zoka Rinpoche says, right now, without delay of even a second. So we plant this seed of bodhicitta and it grows. Every time we grow our love and compassion as we meditate, every time this love grows, we're growing our bodhicitta because love is wishing the beloved to have happiness in all its causes. You know, we think of attached love. We think of love as, oh, I love you so much because this is what you give for me. This is what you do for me. Oh, I love what you do for me. This is attached to love. Real love is wishing the beloved <clears throat> to have happiness and all its causes. So when we are actually doing this meditation, growing our love, this is, this is a wonderful bodhicitta meditation as you're sending that love out. Oh, wishing all beings to have happiness in its causes. Wouldn't it be wonderful? And as we take away all their pain and the love just continues to be an, an unstoppable wellspring of love, we grow it, we send it out, we bring in everybody's suffering and all it does is grow our love. You see, it grows our bodhicitta which begins to eliminate this self-cherishing, I, me, and mine, our own triple gem. We begin to whittle away at that as we begin to grow our love for others. And then as we bring that energy back in that meditation, as we bring that energy back and we dissolve into non-conceptual reality, then we're growing our wisdom of realizing how reality truly exists. So this particular meditation is very powerful. And when we do it every day, we marinate our minds in this bodhicitta and wisdom. So it's so powerful having this. This is, this is a tool when we use it to actually, to actually grow our wisdom and our compassion. So we take a realistic look at our life. Now, this is what we have to do. We have to really look. We take a realistic look at our life. Now, many of us have a very, we could say good life. And we have to remember that we're gonna lose it. And the cause of this life, the cause of this very nice life, that I have a nice home and a nice partner and nice friends and everything I could possibly want. The cause of that, I have planted the seeds for that. Loving kindness, compassion, and wisdom begets more loving kindness, compassion, and wisdom. So having, having all the material things that you want in this life that support your life comes from the practice of generosity. You, know, you give it away, you get it. You know, instead of miserliness, you know, oh, I have to hold it, I have to keep it. Because if I don't keep it, then what will I do? You know, it's funny, that mind, you know, it's so tight. But we recognize what our good fortune, and as the scriptures say, the cause of a precious human life is pure ethics and pure prayer, pure ethics and the rest. So those six perfections that we say, when we say, bless me, to realize the practice of generosity, to realize ethics, patience, joyful effort, concentration and wisdom. So we've been, you know, scriptures say, teachings tell us that we've done that before. And that's how we have what we have in the moment. So we understand its changeable nature, that it is impermanent. And we seek the fortune of good future rebirths by relying on refuge and moral discipline. And if we look at actions and their 
possible result in suffering, then we seek total liberation by relying again on moral discipline, concentration, and wisdom. So these are the three, called the three higher trainings. And then when we recognize how all beings are in the same boat, we seek perfect enlightenment. Again, relying on the three higher trainings, ethics, concentration, and wisdom, then we universalize our own wish for happiness to include all sentient beings. Because we know when mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. So we wish to have all happy. And we meditate in order to recognize the momentary continuity of consciousness. We understand its changeable nature and we develop concentration and mindfulness. We mind our actions of body, speech, and mind, our thoughts, our words, our actions, our deeds. We grow our positive actions. We develop our wisdom, and compassion, and we eliminate our negative actions. You know? By being mindful, we recognize how we are engaging, what we're doing. When we're mindful, we actually see ourselves engaging in positive or negative behaviors. So we cultivate that mindfulness. We recognize the fundamental mind of clear light you know, in the pause recognizing that fundamental mind of clear light. And then through familiarity, we merge indistinguishably with it. We have a total integration, a total unity. Enlightenment. And then we come back by choice to benefit sentient beings. So what is the root cause of this interminable cycling? And how do we get off this wheel? So I'm going to invite you to do another little meditation. So if you'll settle into your meditation posture, and just turn to the breath for a few minutes just a minute, settling into relaxation, attending to the breath. Ten full cycles is a useful starting point. Now take a moment to reflect on an experience, to acknowledge an experience of suffering that you have had. 
fairly benign example, you know, an instance of frustration or disappointment, anxiety, discouragement. Think about that, that time. The feelings that arise around that. How entrenched, even as you recall it now, this experience, how entrenched was the belief in the self who suffered? Notice how intricately woven the sense of self is in this particular story of suffering. And we can sense an entrapment there. Thinking of the nature of the thoughts around it, my thoughts. My feelings. My sensations. Notice the experience of openness or closeness of the heart. Shut down or open. Note that in the recognition or the reco recollection, in this recollection of this suffering, how the I illusion and the suffering co-arise. And as you note the thoughts, the emotions, the sensations that arise within the recollection, watch how fleeting each one is. Just simply watch for a couple. Watch for the gaps between the ever-changing appearance and disappearance of all that arises. And find a gap. Penetrate it and rest there. There is no I 
in the gap. Rest in that peace. Notice it. Rest there. It is that peace that will free and encourage us and light our way home. Inquiry is a focused mind committed to creating the meditative equipoise so that we can see. Surrender is a renunciation of previous attachment and identification. It is a release of ignorance. And once we see through the illusion, we no longer assent to it. The Buddha explained how we create and perpetuate the suffering cycle of samsara, living at the mercy of ignorance. was his insights on dependent arising that were his core realization upon awakening. Their dynamics are a universal map of suffering, a diagram of causes and conditions creating samsara. These are commonly known as the wheel of life. So I want to highlight that now because it's the root of cycling and it's also a means for liberation. So let's see. Mm -hmm. Samsara. Samsara is living at the mercy of ignorance. And it's not a place, it's a set of conditions held in orbit by ignorance and characterized by tension, confusion, and an egoic sense of self. You might remember the eddy meditation we did how the eddy was created, that little waterfall identified itself with all of its bits and pieces circling within it, saw itself as really something like that. So what is it that leads us to assert an independent self that takes rebirth? What is that? Although we know that adult bodies didn't exist at the time of our birth, right? When we say, at the time I was born, if we think about it, we feel there was a self that was born and that this same self exists today. So then it would be a permanent and independent self, independent from the body, right? We also say, today, my mind is calm, indicating that our mind is different today than yesterday when it was disturbed. But we feel that the I is the same as yesterday. So it would be independent of the mind. When we see a flower, we think, I see. And it feels like there's a real person who sees it. And in all these cases, although we know the body and mind change, we still have a sense 
of an enduring I that is the owner of the body and mind, you know, our very own Oz. And this is the basis for believing that there is a permanent, unitary, independent self that goes to heaven or hell or is reborn in another body after death. And from this comes a conclusion that there must be an unchanging, independent I that is present throughout our lives and remains the same, although the mental and physical aggregates change. This is the agent of all the actions, such as walking and talking, thinking. While Buddhists and non-Buddhists accept the existence of the self, our ideas of what that self is differ radically. Most non-Buddhists accept the existence of a permanent unchanging soul or independent self, while Buddhists refute it. You know, I say most non-Buddhists because that's not necessarily true. Certainly in scientific materialism, they don't assert a permanent self. But at any rate, the Prasangika Madhyamaka view, which is generally accepted as the most refined system of tenets. Tenets, they're principles of religion or philosophy, you might say the tenets of a democratic society. So this view says that the self is merely designated in dependence on the body and mind. Merely designated in dependence upon the body and mind, merely labeled on the body and mind. And because the self is merely imputed, we can say I'm young or old, or I think and I feel. If the person were a completely different entity, from the body and mind, it wouldn't change when either the body or mind changes. The egoic sense of self is characterized by suffering. And that's what Buddha noted in his first noble truth. So when we penetratingly inquire into this truth, into this truth of suffering, characterized by this solid, unchanging sense of self, then compassion for ourself arises and compassion for others arise. Also, we have a determined curiosity about the origin of samsara and a commitment to understand what is this origin? What created all this unease? So this is the beginning of the second noble truth, the origin of suffering. The way out of self is paying attention to suffering, unmasking its dynamics and the tense limiting consequences of the dynamics. Recognition of suffering's causes allows us the freedom of options. We begin to use skillful means, proven transformative practice, which is the essence of the fourth noble truth. Understanding how samsara is created and perpetuated removes the veil that clouds our ability to see the true nature of reality. The wisdom realizing emptiness. The wisdom of insight pierces the illusion of the eye who suffers. Wisdom's clear seeing is realization. It's liberating. Renunciation or definite emergence, the willingness to surrender often arises spontaneously with our realizations. Insight and surrender, self-surrender are transformative paths. They lead to the cessation of suffering and the end of the illusion, the third noble truth. 
And the path keeps pointing us in the right direction toward light. As we proceed on our path, we see that awakened awareness, peace, is actually with us every step of the way. We come to know that it's our essential nature, that our essential nature is not other than awakened awareness. The peace that we experience in the pausing and in the insight that arises, resting in the gaps, leads us to a realization of the truth of the cessation of suffering. The peace is the cessation. And we have a taste of awakened mind, a taste of freedom. Suffering ceases as attention rests more and more deeply in the truth, as we increasingly surrender attachment to self. So Buddha's explanation of how we create and perpetuate the suffering cycle of samsara is living at the mercy of ignorance. Ignorance, believing in the true existence of the I illusion and the true existence of phenomena. Buddha's insight on dependent arising were his core realizations upon awakening. And their dynamics are a universal map of suffering a diagram of causes and conditions creating samsara, commonly known as the wheel of life. I think many of you have seen this, this wheel. And they, I found the history of it interesting. This tanka, tanka is a written record. This tanka was created when King Bimbisara had received a precious gift from a neighboring king. And he wanted to repay that generosity. And he asked the Buddha what he could offer this king. And the Buddha explained to him how to draw the wheel of life. And the story goes that the neighboring king, upon receiving this tanka, reading the stanzas inscribed beneath the tanka, immediately developed renunciation and deep insight. And the whole kingdom benefited. Don't you wonder what the inscription said? Because <laughs> usually it's in Tibetan. So what it says is the cause of our unwanted suffering is rooted in the delusions obscuring the essentially pure nature of our mind. The cause of our unwanted suffering is rooted in the delusions obscuring the essentially pure nature of our mind. So in this wheel of life, in the center, we see these three root delusions. The pig representing ignorance, the pigeon or sometimes a rooster representing desire or attachment, and the snake representing hatred or aversion. The pigeon and snake come out of the mouth of the pig, indicating that from ignorance, the others arise, or they're otherwise depicted in a circle showing their interdependence. Under the influence of these delusions and all their derivatives, being born in one of the six realms through the ripening of potentialities previously generated by our wholesome or unwholesome actions through karma, these states can be understood as states of consciousness, states of consciousness. And holding the wheel is Yama, the Lord of death. But we should recognize that these painful experiences shouldn't be seen as a punishment inflicted somewhere from without or a pre existing place of imprisonment. No, all of them are workings of the mind. And because of these delusions, we are born in the six realms, which we went through before. The hell beings, 
their predominant cause is fearful anger and extremely harmful actions, such as murder engaged in while motivated by a very powerful delusion. Even in the human realm, we may experience a measure of suffering, hellish suffering, like when we're really boiling with rage or imprisoned in fearful paranoia. Then there's the hungry spirits or the hungry ghosts whose primary delusion is miserliness. And those beings suffer from an insatiable hunger and thirst. And they experience many obstacles trying to find food. And when they find something, they have difficulty swallowing it down their scrawny necks. The animal realm, the main cause for an animal rebirth is slavishly and stupidly following sensory desires. Animals suffer from limited intelligence, being chased and eaten, used for heavy labor, exposed to heat and cold, and being plagued by hunger and thirst. In the human realm, despite their wishes to experience happiness and avoid suffering, humans are continuously misled by their ignorance and they have to experience unwanted miseries again and again. In terms of spiritual growth, the human realm is the most fortunate of all. Humans can learn to cultivate moral self-control, concentration, and wisdom in order to gain liberation, freedom, and get off the wheel. And the demigods, because of their previous positive actions, enjoy extremely pleasant surroundings, attractive companions, and intense sensory delights. However, they're consumed by jealousy for the superior gods. So instead of enjoying what they have, they engage in continual warfare with those above them. And the gods, some gods are engaged in defending themselves from attacks by inferior asuras, the demigods, while others live a life of uninterrupted sensory indulgence. Others in higher planes abide in blank-minded mental absorption mistaken as liberation. But eventually karma runs out and they face death and fall to lower realms. So really clear to understand that none of the experiences of the six realms is permanent or everlasting. They're totally dependent upon changing causes and circumstances. And psychologically speaking, we can be elevated from a hungry ghost realm to a blissful deva realm in a manner of moments. Sooner or later, our stay comes to an end and we face death. And death isn't the final extin extinction. It's a transition between one life and the next. Mind is a beginningless, endless continuum, moving from life to life, body to body, traveler from one guest house to another. Just as we move up and down in life, depending on causes and conditions, it is the same life to life. The bardo, which is between the end of one life and the beginning of the next life, is the intermediate state. And it's represented by a circle between the delusions and the six realms. The bardo is like a dream between the sleep of death and the reawakening of the next birth. You may recall that Lama Tsongkhapa advised that in order to cultivate wisdom, we should strive to realize dependent arising. This is the mechanism that compels beings to move up and down. And it's the outer circle of the wheel of life, the 12 links of dependent arising. So this is the system of suffering team. This is the team of dependent arising from ignorance, mental formations, consciousness, name and form, six sense bases, contact, feeling or sensation, craving, grasping, becoming, birth, old age and death. These are the 12 links that we go through, not just life to life, but moment to moment. And you can see how it happens. 
and it starts with ignorance. Ignorance is depicted as a blind person. It's the confused fog that arises from our unwillingness to actually inquire into the truth. It rests on assumptions and mistaken conclusions. It's a willingness to ignore. His Holiness the Dalai Lama calls it a misknowing. It's like we think we know, but we've got it wrong. Ignorance is what hides the dynamics of the very formation of the eye illusion. It constricts our attention. It validates and assents to our beliefs. And we're born with this belief. It's deeply rooted in our psyche. And until we pull it out by the root, we will continue to cycle. The result of this belief, the result of this belief in this inherently existent I and other, the result of that is to hold tightly to what we love, wishing that we'll always be like this, never wishing it to end and believing that it never will end and then being devastated when it does. Or on the contrary, we believe we simply must act right now to free ourselves from some unpleasant situation, believing or feeling that it won't ever end. This ignorance is believing something that isn't so. This ignorance is believing that objects, people, places, and things are imbued with qualities that are pleasant, unpleasant, that they are somehow inherently and worthy of possession or inherently hateful and worthy of derision. But an impartial examination uncovers that this is simply not the case. It's the habit of our mind to imbue objects with inherent existence and then seek to either possess them or be free of them. And this is what keeps us trapped on the hedonic treadmill, chasing after something that does not even exist. It's a bit laughable, isn't it? So then what happens? Karmic formation. This is the condition of habit that's deeply ingrained. And this is where our stories, our assumptions, our desires, our beliefs, our narrative consistent memories exist. Karmic formations give shape to momentary arisings. Something momentarily arises. And because of the habit of the mind, because karmic formations, then we give shape to what has arisen. It's the condition of habit that's deeply ingrained. Deeply ingrained. So because of karma, because of actions, then each time an action is created, the potential from that action produces a future rebirth is infused in the consciousness. So this is a consciousness, this is seen as a monkey on the wheel of life. We've got the blind person is ignorance and then comes the potter who is forming the pot, karmic formations, and then monkey mind monkey mind. This potential resides that once we plant the seed in the mental continuum, it resides until it's activated and eventually connects one with a future rebirth. Then comes name and form. So it's seen as uh, two men in a rowboat. When the karmic potential is activated and a new rebirth begins, there is the link of name and form. And name and form refer to mental and physical aggregates of the new life upon conception, the mind and the body that will continue to develop throughout the life of a new embodiment with psychic existence. But in addition, this is interesting. This is interesting because we usually think, oh yes, body, mind, name and form. Name and form is also manifesting in every moment. Every moment that an object appears, we label it. We give it a name and we imbue it with qualities that we believe it inherently has. So interesting. 
to watch how that happens in our own life. So the six sense bases seen as an empty house of open doors and windows. When the karmic potential is activated and a new rebirth begins, there's the link of name and form. Name and form refer to the mental and physical aggregates of the new life upon conception, the mind and the body that will continue to develop throughout the life of a new embodiment within cyclic existence, okay, it continues to develop. It's through the sense power of the eye consciousness that we see form. It's empowered to know form. It's through the ear sense power that the ear consciousness will be empowered to know sound and so forth. Those are the six sense bases. And those six sense bases, once empowered, come into contact. This is depicted on the wheel of life as a couple making love. Once empowered by one of the six sense bases, upon meeting the object, there's contact, right? Contact arises. And this is the moment when the sense base and the respective object, the corresponding consciousness come into contact together. They come together. The mental factor of contact, which occurs at that time, functions to distinguish objects as pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, and thus allows for the experience of the object. It's this first micro moment in that instance of pure, unadorned, bare perception, the naked truth about the object before we label it, before we call it good, bad, or indifferent. So this is the, the unnamed face of the object, the face before the name. And then comes a feeling, and that's seen on the, uh, the wheel of life as a man with an arrow in his eye. So on the basis of contact with objects that are distinguished as pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, the three feelings of happiness, unhappiness, or indifference will respectively arise. Thus com completing the experience of the object. I like it, I don't like it, I don't care about it. But no matter what kind of feeling arises, beings fall under its influence and thus the mind becomes happy, unhappy, or indifferent. And feelings continue throughout that rebirth, becoming the source of a strong drive for obtaining pleasure and avoiding pain during one's life. And feelings grow into craving. Craving is seen as a man drinking wine. In response to the various feelings experienced, there follows craving. The mental factor that is the desire not to be separated from the feeling of happiness, the desire to separate from the feeling of unhappiness. So this craving serves to increase desire without ever producing any real satisfaction. And at the time of death, it serves to nourish the karmic potentials in the consciousness. And craving then grows into grasping, which is seen as a monkey picking fruit. But when the intensity of craving increases and becomes very strong, it develops into grasping. And this is a mental factor that heightens desirous attachment. At the time of death, grasping nourishes and activates a karmic potential in the consciousness. So if you think about it on a day-to-day -day sort of basis, you know, we come into contact with an object. Let's say a donut and a feeling arises. Oh, I like that. And we crave it. And then we grasp it. And we grow this craving into grasping. And then we become the one who has it. 
So 10, a 10th link is becoming. And this is seen as a pregnant woman on the, on the uh, wheel of life. And this link of becoming refers to the karmic potency upon the occasion of being thoroughly nourished and activated by craving and grasping. It is the irresistible urge to become somebody. This karmic potency is empowered to develop into another rebirth, a new existence. And that brings us to birth. And that's a pictured as a woman giving birth on the wheel of life. This link of birth refers to the moment of appropriating the mental and physical aggregates of the next rebirth. Once the karmic potential has connected with another existence. And then after we're born, next comes aging and death. So this is seen as a man carrying a corpse. So aging begins from the very moment of that new rebirth and that it also includes the progressive, what we call aging, I'm aging, but we're beginning to age from the moment we're born. And this occurs throughout that life, as well as the aging of deterioration, the usual degeneration of old age. Death will occur when the consciousness separates from the body at the end of that life. So this is very interesting how these 12 links work. Liberation lies in the sliver of distinction between the content of awareness and awareness itself. We can break free from the entire attention trapping cycle at any time by seeing through a single link. <coughs> 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 we recognize the power with which it has usurped our attention. We see through it and we do not assent to it. So a skillful way to work with each condition is to ask the question, what is looking right now? Ignorance or wisdom? Every last one of us has the capacity to step off this wheel, this wheel of repetition. Karmic formation loses its power when we recognize habitual patterns arising. When we get the hijacker out of the pilot seat. So we say, I'm not my habits of body, speech, and mind. And mindful attention allows us to unbind in each single instance of recognition. Each recognition weakens the power of the entire system of suffering. And we can practice like this throughout the day, but it's our formal practice with silent, unmoving attention that we have the capacity to burn away its power once and for all, to see through it. The condition of consciousness, our quick jump to conclusions, can be recognized in a pause. Pauses have power. It's like poking a stick in the spokes of a spinning wheel. It brings the cycling to a halt. We can recognize name and form, imposing labels on a mere fleeting appearance imputing solid, enduring, separate existence, existence coming from its own side, delicious coming from its own side. And that is precisely the illusion, taking mere appearance as inherent existence, taking a mere appearance as it is like that. Freedom, and kindness arise together and they grow together. 
and freedom manifests as kindness. It manifests in kindness and conversely, kindness grows freedom. Let's cook that, see what that, how that's true. We can come to recognize name or label as having no more substantiality than a thought. You see, as we sit and we watch thoughts come, they need energy to survive. So too does a label. And when we do this with the label I, wow, when we do this with the label I, our human nature and our Buddha nature begin to merge. Unmindfully, unmindfully, the six senses come into contact. You know, we're not, you know, the eye sees and comes into contact, right? But we can stop the cycle's momentum resting at the sense gates. We can stop there without going further, without solidifying. So we can rest in seeing, skipping the noun. We can get off of this cycle. If we study these different links and see how it is that we participate in them, we can cut the link. Every time we question it, we weaken it a little bit so we can snap it and stop following it. And then we have the power to choose. Then we have the power to create an enlightened mind. So Lama Yeshi would always say, check your mind, check your mind. If we have understanding wisdom, we can control the kind of reflection we allow into the mirror of our mind. It's really brilliant. What is it? We can look at each condition that is appearing and we can say, what is looking right now? Ignorance or wisdom? When there is an appearance, what's looking? Nama Zopa Rinpoche often says, merely labeled by the mind. You can make it a practice throughout your day. Driving in my car, merely labeled by my mind. Past the trees, merely labeled by my mind. Getting out of bed, merely labeled by my mind. So this is this, is this practice of really trying to cut through our solid view of what we see. Who's looking? Is ignorance looking or is wisdom looking? So this is our freedom road. You know, we find a teacher and we get on the freedom bus. We live an impeccably ethical life. We recognize how precious life is and that this life will not last long. Death will come, we don't know when. We know our actions, our karma make our world this suffering of samsara leads to, I'm getting out. 
I'm definitely emerging, leads to renunciation. And we enter the path of accumulation, accumulation, accumulating virtue and avoiding non-virtue. And then we intellectually understand emptiness, intellectually, as we enter the path of preparation. But then we see emptiness directly, entering the path of seeing. And we habituate the mind in reality's true nature, entering the path of habituation until there is complete unification, a path of no more learning, this path of enlightenment. Wonderful. Once we step onto it, you know, it's like a seed. This enlightenment, it doesn't have an on and off switch. It's just growing like a seed. We cultivate it. If we cultivate it, it will continue to grow beautifully. That's our job. So let's take a moment to think about the last, these six weeks of coming together and how wonderful to be able to think about the Buddha's teachings. You know, Buddha said, you know, I've shown you the whole path to enlightenment. But whether you become enlightened is completely up to you. As Robert Rinpoche said, you know, the Lama can't throw you up, toss you up into enlightenment like tossing a pebble. So we each one have to practice to try to really understand what these teachings mean and to sit on our cushion and probe deeply. So let's Let's dedicate this positive energy. By merit of this virtue, may I become Buddha and lead all beings everyone into that enlightened state. May the precious body mind not yet born arise and grow, and may that born not decline, but increase more and more. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, find an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of <laughs> merit. May no living creature suffer, commit evil or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or be little with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms, the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth. Those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be free. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other as long as space remains 
as long as sentient beings remain, there too may I remain to dispel the misery of the world. So please also take a moment to dedicate all the positive energy to the long lives of all of our spiritual masters. May their long lives be fruitful. And to our spiritual companions on the path, may a vast rain of Dharma continue to fall. Anyone in our life who is unwell, those on our prayer lists, may they be well. Those who have passed away, may they have fortunate neighbors. And may we quicker than quick become Buddhists without delay of even a second. Elaine? <laughs> yeah. I, I know it's the wrong order, but, but there's something I need to do. Okay. On behalf, of this, on behalf of the center, <laughs> I wanted to thank you sincerely for your teachings for the last six weeks. And I'm so happy that she has accepted to teach again in the, in the next couple of months. So we haven't figured out the date quite yet, but she will be back. So thank you for that, Elaine. You're welcome. And so anyway, so let's do the... Um, the mandala offering, if you wouldn't mind, uh, John, you can put it on the screen. Um, Saji Poki Jokshin Mayamri Rabling G. do it in English now. May my venerable Lama's life be firm, his white divine action spread in the ten directions. May the torch of the teachings of Lozang always remain, dispelling the darkness of all the beings in the three realms. Idam Guru Ratna Mandalaka Niyataya Thank you, thank you, Elaine. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Shanka. It's nice to see your smiling face. <laughs> all right, dears. I hope you all stay well and happy and uh, hope to see you again in the future. Okay, be well. Thank you, Sam. Thank yeah. you, Sam. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Elaine.